Um, so I'm here to talk about today's smart home. We'll talk specifically about lighting and shading control. Uh, a lot of you guys I saw earlier at the Encore house saw some of the products that we were able to put in uh, over the course of the past week to kind of give you a little taste of what you know the home of the future kind of looks like. What we're going to dive into really with, with this presentation is going to be first talking about what is a smart home? What do we mean when we say smart home? Everyone's kind of heard it thrown around. It's a buzzword that's you know definitely in the ethos right now. We want to understand the, the opportunity that we have, you know, where the market's going, current trends, forecasts, things like that. Then we're really going to dive into electric lighting control and then daylight control with shades, uh, the back half, and then you know wrap up. And we're in the home stretch now, so I don't know if you guys look at your agenda, but I'm the last one up here, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief. So, first thing we want to do is understand what a smart home is. Um, primarily, it's a network of IoT devices, so Internet of Things devices, which are Internet enabled have you know sensors, RF chips, things like that in there that speak essentially to the internet, get processed, all that data gets processed into actionable intelligence that you know some of these smart home solutions out there, artificial intelligence like the Amazon Echoes of the world, uh, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg has got his own one he's working on. There's a lot of these AI systems that are out in the market right now. And then again, what the goal of this is is to essentially make your lives easier, right? It's it's not about a bunch of disconnected products that all do this and that. I mean, there have been stories of smart egg cartons that have come out, smart frying pans. I mean, people are, you're going to see over the course of the next few years, they'll put smart in front of anything in order to sell more of them. So really, you know, what matters and what are we looking for? On the left, this is becoming such a big industry that actually Coldwell Banker, the real estate company, and CNET, one of the leading tech companies out there, were actually forced to come up with a definition of what a smart home is because now as homeowners start to move into houses and they start to demand this kind of uh, technology, we need to understand how do we identify a smart home. So when you're on your Zillow, you can essentially filter for smart home technology and know what you're, you're getting into. So what they said, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, but it's a home that is equipped with network connected products for controlling, automating, and optimizing functions, temperature, lighting, safety, security, uh, or entertainment, either remotely by a phone, tablet, computer, or a separate kind of standalone system. So again, not the most eloquent, uh, definition, but it works. It's functional. So what does smart mean? Uh, a lot of companies now are pouring a lot of money into researching this and understanding, again, where the market's going. One of those was uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, who did a large survey of, of homeowners and people who are interested in the technology. Essentially, what does smart mean to you? What kind of benefits are you looking for? And they said a lot of similar things. So one is that it does more than its intended flat function. Second one is you know, the concept of working together. Uh, and something that helps out with everyday life and makes life simpler. One thing that these all have in common is when they kind of distill this down, consumers need a product to either meet a need, solve a problem, or smooth over a major inconvenience to justify a purchase. Again, a smart egg carton tray that costs $80 is nice, but there's a reason that company is bankrupt now, and it's because people aren't spending $80 to see how many eggs they have and how old their eggs are. You know, it's a little bit of overkill, personally. So, again, we want to make things easier. People aren't looking to buy solutions, or they are rather looking to buy solutions. They don't want products. They don't care about technology. As long as it makes their lives easier, it's worth it, and they're you know, potentially willing to invest in it. So, a lot of you guys might be familiar with, with Malcolm Gladwell, one of the you know, premier social psychologists and social scientists of our time. The Tipping Point was his really first big uh, book that got him on the map. And he defines a tipping point as a magic moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses the threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. Uh, I believe, and there's a lot of data to support this, that this is where we are currently uh, with the smart home industry. Again, you'll see it in every store you walk into. They'll have five aisles of smart devices. Smart thermostats are becoming a big category. Voice control is huge. Amazon is shipping out millions of Echoes. I mean, there's, there's a lot of potential for this. Um, and really how do we understand what it is and, and get to where we need to go with it. It's just going to be really looking at the trends and what people are looking for. So primarily the opportunity is huge, and there's no way to really understate this. They're projecting 130 million of these devices are going to be shipped next year, internet-connected devices. Uh, if you look down really where we are in this product cycle, it's been, it's been a ride. So we've been in the game for you know years and haven't really seen the kind of growth and adoption that we've been looking for, but now... Really, we're moving beyond the early adopter stage into this kind of chasm before we hit mass adoption, and this becomes kind of everywhere, ubiquitous. You're going to see all these lights will be internet connected. Everything you walk down the hallway, your shades, your thermostats, everything is going to be hooked into this network with the prevalence of lower-priced devices, like lower-priced sensors and RFID chips, things like that, 
along with the machine learning capabilities of artificial intelligence. Essentially, you place the speaker in your home and it learns from millions of homeowners what you want, anticipates your needs, and makes your life uh, easier. So, by the numbers, 26% of homes currently, and this is a report that just came out, have at least one smart home device. So about a quarter of US homes. What we're getting to is that 45% of the homeowners are actually starting to incorporate smart devices when they're renovating their homes. So we're gonna see that pick up. 86% of millennials uh, are actually willing to pay a premium for smart home technologies. And this is again key because what we're looking at is the kind of the change into having smart home technology be expected. As millennials start to move into homes and get out of renting, you're gonna to start to see this certainly pick up as well. It's becoming a standard home. So this is just from a one you know, developer. We wanted to be a premier home builder in our market. If you're not automating, you're falling behind. So again, we are really moving to that paradigm shift where this stuff becomes expected. It's no longer a luxury, high-end Jetsons type item that you can have. It's something that's real, tangible, and you're gonna you know, live with it. Like you know, automated windows versus motorized windows in the car. If you have to roll down a window now, uh, you're probably just gonna get out of the car and call it Uber. IBM has termed this the fourth industrial revolution to follow the sense of the digital uh, revolution. The new rule is going to be anything that can be connected, will be connected, uh, there's sensors and everything. 61% household penetration forecasted by 2021, 26 billion Internet of Things devices by 2020. Globally, we're looking at $19 trillion in added economic value from the Internet of Things in 2020, so this is just a few years out. Uh, and speaking of lighting, only 100, only 100, 100 million uh, internet connected light bulbs themselves by 2020. And a lot of this is spurred on from the fact that if you look at the five biggest companies in the world, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Facebook, they all are playing in this now within the past few years, and they're throwing billions and billions and billions of dollars at this. You can watch Mark Zuckerberg create his Jarvis artificial intelligence that tries to shoot gray t-shirts to him in the morning, refuses to play Nickelback, uh, turns his lights on, makes himself toast in the morning. I mean, it, it's really getting pretty, pretty impressive. So, let's talk specifically about lighting control. It's kind of my area of focus. Uh, again, it was nice to hear somebody else talking about CRI and where LEDs are and kind of where the industry is going. It gets, gets me excited. Um, we'll talk about some of the cool things we can do there. Why are we talking about lighting control? Uh, primarily, it's, it's one of the most demanded categories for the smart home. So this is a survey, again, by PricewaterhouseCooper. Finds that lighting is actually the top demanded category. And a lot of that is because it's affordable, there's real world benefits for it that we'll talk about, and people are used to it, and you know, the more you hear about LEDs and things like that, the more people are willing to kind of start to replace those devices uh, with, with smarter functionality. What are people looking for? You know, they want to reduce their energy consumption. Uh, something we've talked about today specifically. I mean, LED bulbs are, you know, 80, 85% more efficient than the incandescents we have, uh, last significantly longer. You know, improving comfort for the family, changing your mood or vibe, um, you know, kind of an atmospheric kind of benefit. Really, it boils down to a few. We're talking about energy savings, convenience, aesthetics, and security. And we'll talk about with lighting control and then later on with daylight control how each of these categories, these needs are served by smart devices um, and the Internet of Things. So, when we talk about automated lighting control, it's really two categories, like I, like I said. We have electric lighting control and we have natural day lighting control, but both of those really have to be factored into this story because one without the other just isn't telling the complete picture. It was nice to walk through again the Encore house earlier. There's a lot of natural light coming through there though, so it's even tough to tell if the lights are on or off because there's just so much you know, bright daylight coming through the windows that are all, all around the house. So understanding how they all play together really tells the complete story. With electric lighting control, we're talking about, you know, connected dimmers and switches. A lot of them have RF chips. They might speak over, you know, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or other RF protocols. Uh, connected light bulbs themselves. So some of you guys may be familiar with some products out there that actually are light bulbs or LED bulbs, but they're internet connected. Occupancy and vacancy sensors, another big one we saw that as well in the Encore house, you walk into a, a room, bathroom, let's say, garage, lights come on automatically, you leave, the lights go off. Automated shades on the daylight side of things, daylight sensors, another one to really understand how much ambient light is coming through a window and to be able to adjust your lighting and shading accordingly. Um, so first one here is just gonna be occupancy and vacancy sensing. Simple concept, walk in, lights go on, leave, lights go off. Uh, you know, people have probably been familiar with waving their hands to make the lights go on somewhere. We've really 
blown past that as far as technology now. With, with the ultrasonic and infrared technology that's out there, you know, it's getting down to typing on a keyboard, typing on your iPhone, things like that are also detected as motion and, you know, you don't have to jump up uh, in the middle of the bathroom anymore. So, thank God those years are behind us. But what it does, again, it turns lights off. Link it to shades, temperature, your appliance controls. Uh, vacancy sensing is something where we're talking about automatically turning them off, but you have to manually turn those lights on. So, good application for that might be, you know, kids leave lights on, you put a vacancy sensor in the kid's bedroom. Uh, if you want to go play Tooth Fairy in the middle of the night, you walk into the room, the lights don't shine on and wake the kid up. Probably a good idea. So maybe in a bedroom, we're looking more so for vacancy sensors just to, you don't have to yell at them to turn the lights off, which would make everyone's house a little bit calmer. So I'm sure people would appreciate that. Again, not forgetting to turn the lights off, having it be automatic. You got your hands full, laundry rooms, garages, things like that. That's really where these come into play. And again, if we look back at what homeowners are really looking for, and an extra set of hands in the house is something else that people kind of talk about when they talk about a smart home. I mean, there's no more clear, literal definition of that than the fact that when you walk into a room with your hands full, somebody gets the lights. That somebody happens to be a sensor, uh, not as personal as, as having somebody else there. But again, it makes your lives easier. And eliminating unnecessarily light, unnecessary light with ambient light detection. What that essentially says is if the room's already bright and you don't need the lights, sensors now have gotten to a point where they can say, okay, there's enough daylight in here, we don't need to turn the lights on, let's save a little bit of energy um, and, and you know, leave them off essentially until it gets dark enough that the lights need to come on. Uh, and saving up to 20% on lighting costs you know, with sensors is kind of where, where we're at with that. When we talk about daylight sensing, uh, what we really want to say is that we're automatically turning or dimming lights uh, when we do have an adequate amount of daylight like I was just talking about, and automatically adjusting shades as well. So if you have a certain window that gets a lot of sunlight in the middle of the day, with this smart technology, it can understand, okay, there's a lot of light coming in here, let's lower the shades to essentially, A, keep the you know, room cooler if we're in the summer and we want to keep costs down, um, but also reduce glare, stop fading on furniture, thing like that, uh, with the UV that comes through. Scheduling, another one. Uh, which is big now. Again, in the past, we might have had those you know, little pins you would put in and say, okay, turn the light on at 7 p.m., turn it off at 7 a.m. or whatever it is if you're on vacation to make it look like you're home from a security play. Uh, now we've gotten to the point with the Internet. We don't need that anymore. If one of these switches is hooked up to the Internet, we have astronomical time clocks. It knows based off your GPS's location what time sunrise is, what time sunset is. Uh, it knows what daylight savings time is active or when it's not active, and it, and it can adjust accordingly. So, you know, set it once, you know, it's like a rotisserie chicken, set it and forget it. You set it once, you say, essentially, 20 minutes before sunset, turn these lights on, so when I drive home, uh, I can see into my driveway, things like that. So, predetermined actions at specific times, turning off lights when you don't need them, opening and closing shades based on the sun's location. When this stuff all gets hooked together again with this, this network, there are, there are sites out there that kind of create chain statements that say, if it's going to be sunny today, it'll look at the weather report for your house. It'll say, if it's going to be sunny, then lower my shades. If it's going to be cloudy, raise my shades. Things like this that just, you don't have to think about it anymore. Again, that's the thing. You wake up, you live your life, you say, good morning, coffee starts brewing, you get, you know, the car is heated up. I mean, it just, there's no thought anymore. And, and if we've learned one thing, it's that people enjoy being lazy. I amongst them. Uh, if I don't have to do something, I won't typically do it. So uh, if I can avoid getting up to turn the lights off or to turn the lights on, you can guarantee that I'm not going to do that. And it's sad living with this stuff that I've gotten to that point where it's, ugh, if I have to go up and turn a light switch off. But it's nice. It makes my life easier. So um, again, astronomical time clock. Vacation mode is another one. If you're away, tap one button. It'll randomize your lights essentially on and off throughout the day so you, people know you're not home. As long as you're not posting on Facebook away on vacation or something like that, uh, chances are people will not break into your house, or at least it's a deterrent. Uh, it makes it a little bit tougher to really tell when the house is, is lived in and occupied. From an energy saving standpoint, uh, a lot of research out on this. Essentially, you know, turning off your lights when you don't need them uh, with sensors and daylight sensors, things like that. Uh, you know, obviously saves energy. Dimming saves energy. Even with an LED bulb, it's essentially a one-to-one -one ratio. You dim that bulb 10%, you're saving 10% of the energy costs. In addition to that, talk about putting LED bulbs in you know, glass enclosures and, and how that can shorten the lifespan because you're getting heat. I mean, even LEDs produce some heat, not nearly as much as incandescents, but heat is what's really going to deteriorate that 
phosphor coating on top of an LED diode and, and really start to change the life of that bulb. So dimming it, making it a little bit cooler, you never, never hurt anybody. Get more life out of the bulb and save energy in the process, extending your, extending your life. Convenience, I mean, I just talked about it. Uh, people, are, people are lazy. They don't like to exert effort when they don't need to. Specifically true with lighting. Uh, if you're watching a movie, who's ever watched the movie with the lights on, it's terrible, don't do it. The directors of the movies would be very upset with you. You want to turn the lights off, just say, you know, Alexa, turn the lights off, and you know, don't worry about it. Um, bypass inconveniently placed switches where you now have the ability to essentially control lights from anywhere. You don't need to worry about having a switch in the right area of your house. Um, turning lights off and your hands are full with uh, sensors. Voice controlled interfaces really have started to take off. Uh, you know, Google's, Apple's, Amazon's of the world have really started to get into this, Microsoft as well. Um, you know, it's very intuitive. I, I had, um, in my apartment, I live in New York, we had, you know, some family and friends over for a, for a holiday party this, this past year. And, you know, I had, you know, turn on the Christmas scene and the music starts going on and the lights in the tree come on and all this kind of stuff to the point that it was, she was like 75 or something, a woman who, who works with my, my girlfriend essentially. How do you do this? And she asked her son to get her all the stuff and set it up and now this woman is using her voice to control lights. I mean, something that, again, it defies age. Voice is such a natural way of communicating with things. We've been doing it for millennia. Um, the fact that now we can use it to control every device in our house just makes things easier. So. Um, another big big opportunity here is actually for, for aging and disabled homeowners. A lot of people want independence. They don't want to have to go into a community. Being able to have somebody, let's say we have sensors that know if somebody fell or if they want to turn the lights off, they can do it with their voice. They don't have to stand up if they're wheelchair bound. Things like this, you know, lowering, raising shades. There's countless stories of people who have found benefits, real benefits, in having this kind of easily accessible control of their homes. It lets people live in their homes longer. And, 71% of people who are older than 50 cite the ability to age in their homes as a benefit of smart home technology. So it's funny because on two ends, you can see where the, really the industry is developing. We have younger people who are expecting this technology who are moving into their first homes, and then you have the older people who want to stay in their homes that they've moved into, and, and this industry really benefits both of those sets of people. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Security, we talked a little bit about um, the idea of setting clocks for when you're away to make it look like your home. Another big one is geofencing. So geofencing essentially says, you know, GPS on my phone knows where I am. As I pull home, you know, in my driveway after work, it says, okay, he's within a quarter of a mile. Let's activate the welcome scene, turn on the driveway lights, you know, preheat the oven if you need that to happen, raise the shades to make it welcoming. You never have to then drive in and walk into a, a dark house again. Uh, fumbling around for light switches with your hands full. I mean, those, that's going to be something that we'll tell our kids about someday and our grandkids. Right? I used to have to turn the light switches on. It's, it's, it's going away. We're at the point where this is going to be in our rear view mirror very quickly as the prices start to come down. So geofencing, the other end of it would be you're leaving for vacation. You forget to turn your lights off. As soon as you leave your neighborhood, lights go off, music stops playing. You don't have to worry if you left the oven on anymore and keep checking or drive back. It, it just happens. I mean, it's, it's going to be pretty powerful and, and really change the way that we live. So, Additionally, control from your bedside. You hear a noise in the middle of the night, hit one button, all your lights come on, alarm system gets triggered, their lights come on, the shades raise automatically without you thinking, uh, making you more visible. You might have your exterior lights start to flash to alert you know, ambulances or police who are coming to your house to make you identifiable. Um, also, just being able to, to turn lights off with one button at night. It's honestly the number one most requested thing that we hear is people just want one button, turn all the lights off, shut the house down, go to sleep without walking around. So it's really what we're talking about for security and eventually emergency lighting. With all these things hooked together, this network of devices, there are smart smoke detectors out there now or carbon monoxide detectors that say when there's smoke detected, turn all of my lights on, raise my shades to make it easy to see to get out of my house. I mean, these things all, that's, that's where you can start to see things working together in concert to make your home truly feel smart. And peace of mind when you're away, randomly turning lights off and on like we've just talked about. From an aesthetic standpoint, um, a lot of these are, are easy to see. Dimming just creates ambiance. It's nice to be able to have dinner in a dimly lit dining room, the same reason when you go into a nice restaurant, the lights aren't blaring on you. I mean, it's like controlling the volume on your TV. Sometimes you want it to be loud, but sometimes you want to you tone it down a bit. Uh, if you want to play Yanni or Kenny G or something and have a nice romantic meal, go ahead and do that. Uh, you know, we've gotten to that point where you can do that automatically. So additionally, lowering lights for a movie, dim lighting in a dining room, like I said, peaceful atmosphere for relaxing and reading. And I think you'll notice that 
once lighting control becomes this ubiquitous and easy to adapt and you don't have to walk over and turn a knob anymore like we used to in the past, you'll notice that you adjust it more and you'll probably be living with dimmer lights in general because you know, it's more pleasant for, for a, lot of, a lot of what you're experiencing. So uh, another just quick fact here is that people with dimming control reported higher ratings of uh, lighting quality, overall environment satisfaction, and productivity. It's funny, we talk about aesthetics, I would be remiss if I didn't take one slide to talk about LEDs because the industry is nuts and where the industry is going is crazier. Uh, this is some stuff that is really just on the breaking edge as far as where we're going. Um, they become more affordable, they produce better quality light, we talked about CRI, and they're just more versatile than ever. What I mean when I say versatile is there's something called uh, tunable white, tunable LEDs that are out there. This essentially is your color spectrum from you know, cool to warm, again based off of the Kelvin temperatures as far as you know, blue light versus you know, a warmer kind of candle red light. Uh, what does that really do though? So even on the newer iPads now, there's something, a feature they have called True Tone. What it does, it reads the quality of the light in the room and adjusts the color temperature of the screen so that it's always kind of a pleasant temperature and you don't have that, you've probably seen it on your own phones at this point, it has night shifts, so you don't want to have blue light blaring at you at night. And what that is is it's because essentially at night you want to create melatonin. Uh, from a uh, physiological standpoint, melatonin helps put you to sleep. There's a reason that people take it as a supplement. In the morning you want cortisol to stimulate you and make you ready to go out and greet the day. What's happening now is because we can artificially actually tune the color temperature of the light, we can induce these things. So there have been studies where there are classrooms uh, and in the morning, they hit them with a dose of blue light. The kids get more alert, ready to go. They start learning. Your pupils actually contract when there's blue light coming at them, and it makes it easier to read things. Um, and then after recess, they want to calm the kids down a little bit. They shift the light temperatures within that same room to more of a warm hue. Kids get tired, uh, ready to go to sleep. They're not fighting each other and screaming at the teacher and throwing chairs and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of benefits for this. Um, and what we can see is even doing something like this with jet lag, airplanes are starting to experience this stuff where they can reduce the amount of jet lag you feel by simulating the actual daylight outside of the airplane by putting blue light in the morning and you know, changing that spectrum so that as you go throughout your you know, eight hour flight or whatever it is, the, the red eye, you, you're actually more awake when you land than you would have been in the past. I mean, there is crazy stuff going on even with plants. They can stimulate plant growth more than they can actually out in the natural world using LED light with different color wavelengths of light. It's, it's really getting nuts. And this is where the industry is going. We're very early into this. You won't see these probably at your you know, local Home Depot when you walk in, but we're getting there. We have warm dim lights that might dim down and get a little bit warmer in temperature when you lower the, the, uh, the output, but this is where we're, we're heading. You can actually now separate, you know, essentially the color temperature from the lumen output as well. So you can have those two things don't have to be linked anymore. It doesn't have to get cooler as it dims up or down or whatever. We can now with software and, and technology with LEDs, you can do that independently of itself. And it gets be some pretty crazy um, uh, applications. Again, increasing productivity. That's been essentially quantifiably shown that you can make people more productive by messing with the, the color light temperature that they're, they're living in. And also from an aesthetic standpoint, Designers are starting to do this kind of stuff to highlight certain features of art, so make the reds in that painting pop more, or make the you know brown in that couch be more vibrant or you know less vibrant. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the industry. So, again, I'm up here. I got. I just wanted to tell you guys things are going to get crazy over the next few years. So, uh, strap in for a wild ride. From daylight control, again, we talked about it. Really, is two two standpoints: the daylight and the electric light. Daylight control with shading. Um, we're getting, again, a lot of these same benefits. So you can blend electric and daylight together to really create a, a nice atmosphere aesthetically and, and functionally. Um, sun is the primary light source. You know, there's a reason if we killed these lights, we wouldn't be in pitch black right now. We get a lot of light through those windows, which is nice, and it's, you know, it's beautiful 100% CRI lighting. We should take advantage of that when we have it. Um, so we have to have that as, as a role in the, in the system we have here. Um, convenience, waking up gradually, having your shades kind of gradually open up in the morning automatically when your alarm goes off or 20 minutes before your alarm go off, have your shades come up to kind of greet you. Much more pleasant way of, of waking up, even have some violin music or something come in versus slapping the alarm clock and throwing it across the room. Uh, we're getting to a, a much more pleasant way of waking up. Controlling hard to reach shades, you got shades that are up there, for instance, in, in a house like this you're not touching those. You're not going to get up on a ladder and raise or lower your shades. And I'll show you a little bit of data about 
when people are using their shades, and the answer is not very frequently. Kind of lower them once and just leave them put. Um, but also adjusting them with you know, voice, button press, your location again with your phone, it's getting, uh, it's getting easier. From a security standpoint, a lot of the same integration. These shades will raise automatically if an intruder detected and your alarm system goes off, your shades will open up to make it easier to spot them. Um, they raise automatically when smoke is detected, adjusting shades when you're away. So, you know, stepping it up from just the lights going up and down, you can have your shades open and close and really throw, throw off anybody who's, you know, scoping the house. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't hurt as a benefit. Reducing glare from an aesthetic standpoint, obviously a benefit of, of all shades, but again, being able to use them more frequently and adjust them with the daylight makes, makes things more practical and, and more useful. Uh, daylight glare, 25% lower productivity when you got sun shining in your face, so you know, getting rid of that, protecting your furniture and your art and your floors from the UV that comes through, preserving your views, and also you know, a little bit more privacy. So lowering them if you get out of the tub or something, you want to lower your shades automatically, do that with a button press in your bathroom. I mean, things like that will just become kind of second nature as well. From an energy saving standpoint, uh, unmanaged daylight leads to all those bad things we talked about, glare, heat, waste, a lot of, a lot of heat is lost through the windows. Um, 10 to 20 percent only of manual, you know, old, old shades are actively controlled. So most people aren't touching their shades. They throw them, they leave them, uh, they don't mess with them. Uh, 45 to 75 percent of shades don't move at all. Um, this is like the shades in my parents' house growing up where they were convinced that I would break them inevitably if I were to touch them, so we just didn't touch the shades because they were on a very small little string and we wanted to make sure we didn't break them. Um, and again, reducing heat gain 45% on a sunny day just by controlling your shades. So simple stuff, and again, as that becomes easier through the smart home industry, there's no reason we wouldn't do it more frequently or have it happen on its own. Uh, automatically lowering shades if the temperature is too hot is another really nice application of fusing the smart thermostat with smart shades so that if it detects that the temperature is approaching 90 degrees, which hopefully we're getting a little bit closer to that, and we've had a few cold days recently, but as it gets warmer, you know, open or close the shades accordingly to make sure uh, that you control your temperature. 10 to 30 percent reduction on heating and cooling costs annually uh, with, with motorized remote controlled automated shades. In summary, I mean, we talked about a lot as far as where the industry is going. The key thing to know here, the big takeaway, is that the industry is beginning to enter a period of mass adoption. You're going to get real sick of this over the next few years. Every commercial is going to be for smart this, smart that. Uh, but what people really want, and the second bullet point, is they want solutions to problems. And I think we talked a little bit about the solutions that are out there and how lighting control really can contribute to making your lives easier and providing a benefit. Um, lighting control is one of the most requested product categories in the smart home, both electric and daylight. Uh, consumers are very well aware of this industry. Right now I think it, awareness is I think 87% of Americans know that this is out there. What's going to happen now is those people are, again, going to move into homes that have smart home technology or they're going to want to stay in their homes and they'll put in a few smart devices so they can stay there longer and remain autonomous. Um, but they really want convenience, aesthetics, security, energy savings. Those things are true across every product category we have. Um, and then also sensing, daylight control, and scheduling of lights really do deliver value. Uh, in these categories, so you're gonna you're gonna start to see that as well. So, thank you, and I'll take uh, any questions. Yep. Um, for like, I know in the future, like we're going to like have like different like colors, like um, but for like shading, do you like shade windows like to make the house like look like pitch black, especially in the daylight setting? Yeah, so they have um, there are blackout shades that are out there, um, which will essentially block any light from coming in as long as you don't have there occasionally you'll have little call them side little channels of light on the side if the window doesn't cover the entire window and there's a little you know quarter of an inch on either side or something you'll see light come through but you can black out uh, you could be it could be outside like this and you could if you had blackout shades it would be essentially pitch black in here for lack of a better term yep and like what about like during the winter like some people like have like seasonal yeah, it's very. It's a good question. I hadn't thought about. I, if nobody's working on that, I would recommend you know reaching out and file a patent or something. I, I 
can imagine that will become certainly something that will happen if, if people re if they more of the science comes out and people determine that they need a certain amount of a certain color of light and they're not getting enough of it because it's winter. And if you can simulate daylight inside, like with the plane situation with jet lag, I don't see any reason you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, you know, again, when you step outside, it's going to be very dark and depressing. But at least while you're inside, uh, you can you know simulate the outside. So I don't I don't see any reason that can't happen. But I don't know of anyone doing that now. Yes. Uh, the little house over there is a, uh, it's called Caseta. Uh, so, that's the smallest one you guys have. Yep, yeah, that's like kind of an entry level uh, smart lighting control system. Yep. And then, do you guys sell a lot of the chains? We do, yeah, there's a, a lot. I mean, from the commercial and the residential end, uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, demand for those right now as far as motorized shades. A lot of houses, again, are having those come standard when you move in. Um, so, yeah, it's a big, big industry. And do you see Uh, I don't know how many of the standalone bulbs are selling with the internet connectivity. I mean, I'm, I don't know the comparisons, but I know you know a lot of people are buying internet connected switches and dimmers and things. And thermostats is another really big category as far as smart home devices with companies like Nest and things like that. Um, but yeah, you'll start to see start to see a lot more of them. Yep. Any other questions? No. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Should I just disconnect? Uh, yeah, just.